Hey everyone, top three places you can't go and people who went anyways, part 10. Have you guys seen it? Because we haven't. All right, let's jump into it. I didn't think there was anything more claustrophobia inducing and terrifying than being trapped in an underwater cave. Right. That is until I discovered today's top story. Oh, come on. But before oh, we no. get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please sneak into the like button's house and open up all of their cereal. But when you open the bags, make sure you tear them in such a way that you rip down oh. the side oh. of the bag, not along the intended seams at the top. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of Seriously. our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Okay, something that's worse than an underwater cave? That's I debatable. I don't know about this, man. No boundary. Daniel Dukes always seemed to have an issue with respecting boundaries. In 1996, when Daniel was 24 years old, he became obsessed with this video game series called Ultima, which in the early days of PC gaming was this huge hit. It was this open world role-playing fantasy game. Daniel figured out where the creator of this game lived, and in the middle of the night, in the spring of that year, he went to this guy's house and he knocked on the door. What the what? hell? The creator did not answer the door. Daniel's frustrated and he leaves but comes back a couple hours later and proceeds to break a window climb inside this guy's house he oh. goes upstairs and he goes into one of the bedrooms where he crawls into one of the beds and falls asleep the next morning what? when the creator got up he finds daniel laying in one of his beds and he starts yelling at him to get out of his house and daniel's totally unfazed and he just wants to sleep in this bed and so the guy calls the police the police show up and daniel's still in bed and so they haul him out and they arrest what the him hell? a year later daniel would be arrested again for trespassing this time in Orlando, Florida at SeaWorld where Daniel had after hours snuck into the manatee exhibit and was swimming around with the manatees because what? apparently he wanted to this play guy with is them. Ridiculous. But despite his criminal history, Daniel was far from a hardened criminal. In fact, many people that knew him described him as a very gentle pot-smoking hippie who just adored animals. In 1999, when Daniel was 27, he joined a small religious community of people that practiced Hare Krishna, which is a branch of Hinduism. They get their name from their chant, Hare Krishna, that devotees repeat over and over and over again. During his stay with this community, Daniel basically blew off all of his responsibilities. He didn't really practice oh the religion. He didn't help out around the temple. Instead, he spent virtually all of his time feeding the wild birds that came to roost in Side of the temple's garden and he kept this notebook where he diligently tracked who had come into the garden which bird and how much he had fed them and what they looked like basically all he cared about were these birds okay. after a month <laughs> of right. living in the Hare krishna community daniel abruptly tells the other worshipers that he's going to be taking a vow of silence and this really confused the others because oh, Hare weird. krishna does not encourage its members to take vows of silence this was something daniel was just going to do on his own and so right before he took his vow of silence, he also informed them that he would be leaving. So he takes his vow of silence, oh. he packs his stuff up, and he leaves. After departing, Daniel committed a series of petty offenses through South Carolina, Washington, Texas, and then ultimately in Florida. One of his offenses in Florida was stealing a candy bar at a 7-Eleven. And in court, because of his vow of silence that he was still living Dude. up to, wow. he had to write on a piece of paper that he denied the charge but ultimately he was sent to jail for three days. After his stint in this Florida jail, Daniel gets out and he decides he wants to go back to Orlando, Florida and go to the Sea World where he had previously jumped into is the it, manatee exhibit. Is the exhibit. vow of silence and so permanent? he was gonna go and presumably yeah, so. check out the manatees as well as some other animals. When he got to the park, he made his way over to the killer whale demonstration where some trainers were gonna be swimming around in this enclosure with these massive killer whales. And witnesses said they remember seeing Daniel in the stands watching the Wait. show being just totally transfixed and open-mouthed and fascinated with what he was looking at. But uh -huh. apparently Daniel's biggest reaction to any part in the show was when the trainers brought out Tilikum, the biggest killer whale ever held in captivity, oh God, where's this going? measuring over 22 feet long and weighing over 12,000 pounds. Daniel was just totally taken wow. with Tilikum. Wow. So that night, after the park shut down and everyone went home, Daniel came back, now wearing a bathing suit, he hops the fence and he sneaks back into Dude. SeaWorld the same way he did a couple years earlier when he snuck into the manatee exhibit. 
And somehow he managed to go through the park without being picked up on a camera. And he makes his way over That's to the crazy. killer whale enclosure. He hops the fence. He takes off his shirt, takes off his shoes. So he's just got his bathing suit on. And he jumps into the massive pool with no. telecom. When Daniel jumped into the manatee exhibit, he had said he just wanted to play with the manatees. And so it's assumed that when he jumped in with Tillicum, he just wanted to play with Tillicum. And apparently Tillicum was really eager to play with Daniel because Tillicum oh God, quickly mouth. played with Daniel by biting his shorts and bringing him to the bottom of the pool oh. and dragging him along the bottom until Daniel drowned. And oh, then after he drowned, shit. Tillicum basically thrashed him around, throwing him up and down, ripping off pieces oh of him God. until oh. finally he draped Daniel's body over his back and that's where Tillicum kept him. The next day, when the staff showed up and made this discovery, they couldn't get Daniel's body away from Tillicum because Tillicum wanted to keep his toy. Right. And so they had to use a special medical hoist to lift Tillicum up into the air to recover Daniel's body. Oh, Daniel's crap. death was yeah, an accident as a result of his poor decision making. And so as such, Tillicum was not punished. Well, that's good. He went swimming with a killer whale. For like, fun. I just want to play with him. Yeah, what do you think a killer whale does for fun? It's a killer whale, damn it! Well, I mean, they said he wanted to keep his toys, so... They are kind of fun. A really messed up one. Yeah. Don't swim with, don't swim with killer whales. In 1910, miners drilling inside of the Nika cave in Chihuahua, Mexico, punctured through the ground and discovered this flooded cavern. After pumping the water out and stepping inside of this cavern, they were amazed to see these massive gypsum crystals that had formed on the walls and the ceiling all over this so cave. Cool. Although the crystals were beautiful, they were far less valuable than what these miners were after, which was silver. So instead of trying to, you know, mine out these crystals, they told the locals in the area that they had found this cave and that they really ought to come down here and protect it because it's this amazing natural wonder. And so for the next hundred years, the locals in Chihuahua, Mexico, basically kept this cave that they nicknamed the Cave of Swords under lock and key so that no wow. one would go in there and destroy these amazing crystals. Fast forward to the year 2000 and two men are inside of this mine, not the Nika mine where the Cave of Swords is located, but a mine that was right up against it and they're drilling down and they're actually at the same level of where the Cave of Swords is located. And they don't know it yet, but they're drilling underneath the Cave of Swords. And they eventually Ooh. puncture into the rock, revealing this underground flooded cavern. Now these two men are not tracking that this is right underneath the Cave of Swords. So they're not thinking there could be crystals inside of this flooded cavern. <laughs> they're thinking there could be silver down there. Mm. So after pumping all the water out of this cavern, they crawl down inside and it opens up into this massive cavern with these enormous crystals. Wow, look at that. Ceiling, the walls everywhere. And they are like 10 times, 15 <laughs> times bigger than any of the biggest crystals inside of the Cave of Swords. These are literally the biggest crystals in the world. And this cavern looks like Superman's Fortress of Solitude, <laughs> this unbelievable landscape. This new cave would be dubbed the Giant Crystal Cave. And like its counterpart, the Cave of Swords, it would be handed over to locals to protect. Now you'd think people would be lining up like crazy to get inside either- Look at the size of that. Wow. wow. He's puny compared to that crystal. I mean, How does that even cave, happen? Caves of Swords, definitely a way cooler name yeah. than Giant Crystal Cave. Yeah. <laughs> but I got to admit, these are fucking cool. ...of these two caves to see these natural wow. wonders. But the truth is, nobody wants to go inside of these caves because they're death traps. Even though both of these caves have had the water drained out of them, their humidity level is still 100%, which means oh. if you're in there too long in either of these two caves, you run the risk of your lungs starting to fill with water, effectively drowning you. Oh God. In fact, scientists wow. speculate that it would take about 10 minutes for this to happen to you if you were inside one of these caves, assuming you were not wearing a special breathing device that was pumping dry air back into you. But even if you were wearing these special air tanks, the cave would still kill you in about an hour because the temperature exceeds 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, how so do these guys find these caves? The extreme mm -hmm. heat with the humidity and the tight enclosed nature of an underground cave, you have a natural oven. 
that if you stay in there too long, it will cook you alive. So the yeah. only people Jeez. that go inside of these wow. caves are researchers that wear all the special equipment and they only go Look inside for a couple are. of minutes at most. That's crazy. But in 2001, so one year after the discovery of the big crystal cave, one of the workers who helped drain out the big crystal cave decided, you know what? I want a crystal for myself. And so using his understanding of the mine and his access to this particular section of the mine, he made his way down and got inside of the big crystal cave. Now, the only special equipment he had was a saw because he figured he could get in oh, there and dude. saw off a piece of one of these crystals and get out of there in just a couple of minutes, certainly well before anything bad would happen to him. So he gets inside, he identifies the crystal he wants, and he starts sawing off the bottom of this crystal but it dislodges a huge chunk of the crystal that falls on him. Oh, now, shit. when it fell on him, oh, no. that didn't kill him, but it pinned him inside of this cave. At this point, reality must have sunk in very quickly for this guy. He didn't tell anyone where he was going because what he was doing was illegal. Oh. And he knows that nobody checks inside of these caves to see if people are trapped or stuck oh, because no. they don't expect people to go into these caves and they're off limits. A couple of days later, researchers went down into Big Crystal Cave and they discovered this guy still pinned underneath the big crystal he had cut from the ceiling. It was unclear whether he had died from drowning oh. or from being cooked alive, but either way, he was deceased. To this day, Eesh. Big Crystal Cave and the Cave of Swords are strictly off limits to the public. That's probably for the Valid. best. Well, it wasn't silver, it was just crystals? Yeah, like minerals. Yeah. I can't believe they're so big. I can't believe you can just cut them with a saw. That's true, too. I wasn't expecting like, that. It went over just like, <laughs> like it's wood. Yeah. I'm like, mm, are crystals that fragile then? Yeah, I, I don't know. Because I was expecting him to like cut the, the crystal and then like it just caved in because like yeah. one of the crystals was just <laughs> holding the whole thing up like a support beam. On June 30th, 2002, an 18-year-old named Daniel Dick was on vacation with his mother and his two younger brothers in Hawaii. Daniel had just graduated from his high school in Los Angeles, where he was the student body president. He was known to invite all of his classmates over to his house all the time for dinners, and girls would call him all the time to try to get advice about their boyfriends. And Daniel also would befriend troubled teens in an attempt to kind of pick them up and get them back on the straight and narrow. When he and his family left for this vacation, he had been working part-time at a grocery store and was getting ready to attend California State University in the fall. That morning, Daniel went down to the beach where he planned on doing some swimming and maybe laying out in the sun for a little bit. And pretty quickly, he met three girls. And after about 30 minutes of chatting with them, he asked them if they wanted to climb over the fence and check out the blowhole. A blowhole is a fairly narrow hole that is situated on rocks right near where water is crashing. And this hole is usually formed by oh. molten lava that is passed through underneath. And what happens is this hole is connected to a tunnel that feeds down and out into the water. So when the waves come in, they go through this tunnel and they get rocketed up this little opening, causing a massive geyser of water. Now, if you don't go near the blowhole, it's not dangerous at all. It's just a very cool natural phenomenon. Typical. The beach that Daniel and these girls were on was situated right near an infamously dangerous blowhole called the Halona blowhole. The reason it was so dangerous is because the water it connected to through that tunnel was some of the most violent in all of Hawaii. So oh, wow. when those waves Oof. came barreling through the tunnel, it would shoot 30 plus feet in the air. And so to make sure everybody understood you're only allowed to watch the blowhole from a distance, they actually put up a fence all the way around it and put up signs saying, do not go any closer. To give you a sense of how powerful the water was that was churning through this tunnel, if you were standing on the other side of the fence, watching the blowhole from a safe distance, you could feel the ground shaking as the waves would rumble through the tunnel and then explode out of the blowhole. Wow. According to Daniel's family and friends, he was not a reckless person. He was just a very adventurous person. Mm -hmm. And so something like this blowhole really piqued his interest and he just couldn't handle being on the outside of the fence. He really wanted to get right up there and get a look at it. In fact, he told these girls he wanted to feel the power of the water hit him in the chest. Dude! The girls told him this is a bad <laughs> Dude. idea. Dude, uh, 30 feet. And he began walking over to the oh rocks. Oh my God, no. Dude, I want no. I want to feel what it's like to get hit by a truck. Literally, he's gonna get launched. He's, oh, the it's fence. just terrible. The girls went with him, but they stopped short of the fence. As Daniel made his way over to the rocks, he passed by a couple that was laying on the beach 
He waved to them. He climbed up the rocks. He climbed over the fence, and he made his way over to the. Blow he hole. waved he at a couple it to where before a wave he went just in. come in and shot a geyser up. And then, as soon as the water went down and there was a break, he walked over the edge of this hole that was not very far across. Oh my! He kind of arched himself over it, so his chest was hovering. Oh, dude, crap! He's asking and for it, dude. And initially, a wave came through, and the water shot up, and it hit him in the chest, and it kind of staggered him back for a minute. And at this point, the three girls and the couple that he had passed are now yelling for him to get away from the blowhole that it's way too dangerous but it was too late he leaned back over the blowhole right as a massive wave came barreling through the tunnel it rocketed up and it lifted him off the ground about five feet in the air and it turned him upside down so his head is pointed down and when he fell he went directly into the blow oh the fucking the hell girls that saw this happen described his body position as being the perfect dive and in order to actually get into the blowhole, you would need the perfect body position because oh the opening God. is very narrow and it goes down oh eight feet of just this God. narrow, narrow tube. And at the bottom of that, it opens up like the inside of a teapot. Then inside of there is this just vicious churning water that connects to this underground tunnel that oh feeds my out God. to the sea. And so when Daniel went head first down, his momentum along with his perfect body position forced himself down through that hole into that section that's kind of like the inside of a teapot. And once you're inside, there's no way to go back up again. The opening is too tight and there's nothing to hold on to. You wouldn't have the ability to force yourself up through that hole again. So the only way out is through the underground tunnel that leads out to the sea. But there are constantly waves pounding yeah. their way up this tunnel into the section where Daniel had fallen wow. into. And so realistically, anybody that tries to swim through this fairly long underground tunnel is only gonna get so far before a wave forces them back or traps them in some way in this underground tunnel. As soon as Daniel went into the blowhole, the couple and the three girls immediately- He has to be like, completely messed up in the sense of like broken arm or s completely scraped up because what, what did he just go in there like a nothing but net just it, it sounds like it because that's just like because they said it was like a perfect dive meaning he didn't hit the walls or anything oh, i mean he might have once he got in i would imagine but that's what but like you can't even push yourself out so I like know. how perfect was the dive i know immediately climbed up the rocks hopped over the fence and began looking into the tunnel, yelling for Daniel. And as they're sitting there yelling for him and yelling for people on the beach to call 911, they would feel the ground start to shake oh as God. another wave would come through the tunnel and erupt through the blowhole. And they know every time that happened, Daniel, if he was alive, he was completely submerged in water for 30 seconds or so every iteration that this blowhole erupted. By the time the police showed up, Daniel has been trapped inside of this blowhole for some time and no one's heard him, no one's seen him, and so it's starting to look pretty grim. And the police would say it's nearly impossible for anybody to survive being inside of this blowhole, especially at high tide, which is when he went in. In fact, the police would say, we can't even send divers in there until low tide, because if we send someone in now, they're going to get killed inside of this blowhole. It's too violent inside of there. And so the best they could do was put a weighted line into the blowhole anchored on the outside so that if by some miracle Daniel was still alive, he'd be able to grab this line and pull himself up. He probably would not be able to pull himself through the hole to safety but at least he could keep himself out of the water until rescuers could get there the next day at low tide. But when low tide came but the next day and divers- Wasn't his body also up head first? No, his body went head first. There's an open section that he could- Oh, he could probably could have flipped around? Yeah. Oh, okay. Just went out to the water. They discovered Daniel's body. It was floating near the area where water actually gets sucked into the tunnel and out through the blowhole. During low tide, he must have been pulled back out through the tunnel out to sea. It's unclear how long Daniel was alive once he landed inside of the blowhole or whether he ever attempted to actually swim through that tunnel out to sea, but at some point he did drown. Daniel's mother petitioned to have a metal grate put over the blowhole so that nobody else would fall in and meet the same fate as her son. But this proposal was met with criticism from the locals who said the problem was not the blowhole, the problem was people not respecting the power of nature. And so while a fence still surrounds Halona blowhole telling people to stay back, the entrance to the blowhole is still uncovered. So that's going to do it, guys. Hmm. If you found the Valid. secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments. If a metal grate's not going to... I mean, it's like underwater caves, right? Like in other places, they're they like, hey, don't, don't come in here, you'll die. Yeah. And then you ruin the experience for everyone else.
Yeah, You're but, like, her kid wasn't, like, looking for trouble. He was looking for adventure, like... He looked to get could prevent punched someone in else. the chest by a geyser, and then he, like, he got hit once, and it was like, one more time. That's true. At that point, like, and, I mean, there was multiple warnings. I so know. it's like, if one person makes a mistake, everyone else suffers. Why we have those one-way signs on highways. Yeah. Someone went the wrong way. Obviously. Jeez, man. Well, I can't imagine pic like picturing that. Imagine seeing that in real life of this guy going flying and then sucking down in this hole. I mean, I wouldn't even look like the way that it hit him, how it got him in the angle. Yeah. I mean, that alone says enough about like, yeah, don't mess with geysers. I'll take your yeah. word for it. I don't need <laughs> yeah. to experience it. Yeah, totally. Oof. Well, on that note, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you saw, please subscribe. If you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments, and we'll see you in the next one. Yeah, see ya. Bye.